So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, April the 8th, and this is episode number 154 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So what's the temperature outside? 35 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 2 degrees Celsius, with rain on the way, of course. And even the potential, believe it or not, for snow tomorrow. Also, we have heavy pollen days coming. All the colonies are bringing in pollen to their landing boards. Great evidence that there's a laying queen in there and that they made it through winter. Good news. And uh, if you're counting more than 10 trips, 10 bees coming in with pollen on them every minute or more, then there's a very good chance you have really good brood development going on and you want to be prepared because guess what's going to happen? We're going to have swarms. Looking at my record, swarms at the end of the month. So starting the 26th or 27th, which means we need to be ahead of that by expanding our colonies, unless you're planning to make splits. So where's the pollen coming from? Heavy pollen on Sunday and Monday, according to the forecast. And that's aspens, willow trees, maples, elms, and alders. And you're probably sitting there thinking, how do you know what pollen's coming out? Well, the best place to check in to find out when pollen's going to be abundant for your bees and what the sources are going to be would be with the allergy expert. So people that suffer from pollen allergies are actually a benefit to the beekeepers because when they get these early warnings, because they have to know when to take their medication, when to stay inside, when to be near filtered air and stay away from all the pollen that's moving around in spring, that information is very beneficial to us because we know when there's going to be a big pollen boost on our beehives. So the other thing is uh, pollen substitute. Ultra bee dry pollen sub specifically is being ignored by the bees where there were thousands of bees on it a week ago. Now you might get 10 or 15 and uh, so that shows us they're getting what they need from the environment and that they prefer the pollen that they find in the environment over the pollen substitute, which is just an early trigger to get them going. And for those of you who are gauging maybe how much pollen sub to have on hand for your bees, mine went through one 10 gallon, no, one 10 pound bucket of ultra bee dry pollen sub. That was it. So I've got another 10 pound uh, bucket of that ready for the fall, for the fall dearth when the bees are getting ready to go into winter. So what else is going on? I think that's pretty much it. And if you're brand new, welcome. If you're returning, thank you for coming back, even though you knew I was going to be here. And if you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the comment or the video description below, and you'll see everything line item by line item and related links that might be helpful to you. And uh, since there are 154 episodes, maybe you could click the thumbs up button and that way you would know that uh, you've seen this episode, because there's a lot of them. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, the very first question comes from Jen, Amherst, Massachusetts. Please tell me that you approve of and like the Ultimate Hive Stand, because I just ordered three. I hope they will raise the hives high enough off the ground to deter skunks. Okay, so first of all, for those of you who don't know, the Ultimate Hive Stand is made by a company called Be Smart Designs. And they're black and they're a heavy plastic and they're made out of recycled material. And what else can you tell you about them? They're designed for a single hive, Langstroth style. They'll accommodate a 10 frame. There's also an 8 frame hive version. So they have different lengths of braces that go between the sides of it. So do I like them? Let's start there. Yes, I do. And I've had them since they first came out. In fact, they've changed the design since I first started buying them. There are things that uh, I don't like, as with a lot of different things. So, for example, uh, the Ultimate Hive Stand. Everything that comes from Be Smart Designs is an ultimate feeder, an ultimate cover, an ultimate bottom board. And these are designed to go with the Be Smart Designs bottom boards. But that doesn't mean you have to use the bottom board, but you have to use a bottom board and it's because when these hive stands are put together to get their greatest rigidity they have to have a bottom board screws go through it and the screws come with the stands they hold up to weed whacking of course they never rot because they're 
plastic. There's been no evidence that they've broken down from UV light, so there are a lot of bonuses. But uh, to answer this question from Jen in Amherst, they're not tall enough for skunks. Now in the past, probably when they designed them, if they were basing um, their guesstimate about how high a skunk would uh, reach to get to the landing board to harass your bees at nighttime and eat bees even, there were a lot of early sources that came out and said skunks will not eat bees if they have to lift themselves off the ground and expose their stomach. So they said any time a, a skunk had to reach up and grab onto anything that elevated their stomach and exposed it to stinging, that that was enough that that would not uh, <clears throat> allow the skunk to feed. So the only then the only hives that were at risk were those sitting, of course, directly on the ground or just with a shim directly under them on the ground. They're right in skunk munch range. So I have all of my hives off the ground and I didn't, I didn't think that was high enough. So I know I'm explaining more than necessary here, but I want to give you the logic behind why I don't think they're tall enough to keep skunks away. Uh, so I set up video cameras because cameras don't lie. We can speculate, you know, but until we see the behavior and that's what cameras do, they give us the behavior which helps us problem solve. So we have skunks coming through at night, which by the way I like. I don't mind skunks being around. I don't mind them cleaning up dead bees from the ground and things like that. But when they can jump up and scratch the landing board and put your bees in a defensive posture throughout the night, then uh, that's a problem. So if they're harassing your bees, you need to raise them. So the Bee Smart Designs Ultimate Hive Stands are not tall enough as is when you put a solid bottom board on there or the ultimate bottom board, which is screened. Then uh, what I do is I do two by fours. So I make a frame out of two by fours, the exact size outside dimensions of the bottom board that's gonna sit on it. So if that's the 10 frame or the eight frame, just match those outside dimensions, add that uh, added height from the two by fours, and now it's out of reach of the skunk. We determine the skunks can go, they can reach all the way up to 17 inches. Some bigger skunks, they stand on their hind feet and scratch the boards. But if we hit the 18th inch, 17 to 18 inches, they can't get their footing and they fall off and they don't bother the bees anymore. So that's where we're at. Every hive in my apiary is now at 18 inches or higher. So for that reason. So, but do I like them? Yes. Another thing I did not care for about the Bee Smart Design stand they have little flip out plastic supports for your frames, which seems convenient. It seems like that would be great to support your frames while you're doing an inspection. You put them down there, it clips on the side of the hive stand. Great positioning, great distance. They're just not very strong in my opinion. So I like the uh, frame supporters that clip onto the actual wood of the box that you're inspecting. And then you put your frames right up there, up high, right next to where you're doing your inspection. Uh, another way that I use the B-Smart stands is because they're lightweight. Some people weigh them down by filling them with water or filling them with sand. I highly recommend if you're looking for something to fill it with, to add weight to it, that you use sand over water. And that's because if you're in an area where it gets really cold and it freezes, the water's in there, the water freezes and splits out the plastic. So sand if anything, but I don't put anything to fill them at all. And uh, also I have extras. So what I did was I took a solid bottom board, whatever old worn out bottom board is when you're swapping out your gear and you're giving them new equipment. I took the old one and I screwed those in and made those a platform, a portable platform. So whenever I'm going to do an inspection, if there's not enough room to set frames and things next to it, I set that uh, ultimate hive stand right next to the hive I'm gonna work on and that's my staging area. No more bending down, no more going to the ground to pick things up. You have a nice hive stand right there and they're, they're built to support beehives, hundreds of pounds. So they certainly support uh, frames and gear that we're working with or inspecting. So I do recommend them, but those are the changes. You can elevate them by putting that wooden frame on there or you can put pavers underneath that lifts up the hive from the bottom. So a couple of options there. Going on to question number two, Bryce Bennett. Electric fence strength. This is timely, so I'm glad that Bryce asked this question because what has come out of hibernation right now where we live? I don't know what you're facing wherever you are in the world. 
But here we have black bears and black bears cover a huge territory every night and they're hungry when they come out of hibernation. Uh, so what they're doing is they're running around and there's evidence that they're raiding apiaries, backyard apiaries, commercial apiaries, whatever that happens to be. But the good news is electric fences do work, but I'll read the question here. Good morning, Fred. I'm from central New Hampshire. What is a jewel? And how many do I need to keep black bears out of my bees? Thanks for all you do. Well, thanks for sending the question and thanks for watching. Here's the thing. Uh, whether we know what a joule is or how many volts and then how many amps and so on is necessary to deter bees, you might think that somebody could have done a study about that, right? And guess what happened? There is a study about it. So rather than what I think joules are and how many joules you need, first of all, do I have an electric fence around my apiary? Right now I don't. But I'm split into two yards right now, right here. And I have a two and a half acre field that's surrounded by electric fence and the electric fence is off. And then I have a second one acre field that has beehives in it. It also has an electric fence around it, but the electricity is also not flowing there. And why is that? It's because I'm testing out something different. And I know I'm risking all my beehives because I'm in bear country. But I have the noise makers, their motion detectors, they're set to come on at nighttime only. And I didn't do a review of them. I didn't share about them because I wanted to see it through an entire year, as I do with most things that I review. Unless it's obviously an advantage, I wait and see. Because we have fox and we have coyotes and we have skunks and we have rabbits and we have deer and we have bears and we have mink and we have uh, fisher cats and we have weasels and all these other things running around. So I like to see what their reactions are to these noisemakers. And any movement detected, they go off and they're solar powered so they stay charged and they run for 45 seconds minimum unless the animal stays around. My thoughts on that are bears don't like noise. Bears don't care about light. So if you had uh, motion detector floodlights, for example, that come on in your apiary and a bear is walking through and those floodlights come on, the first time they're visiting the apiary, they might be startled by the floodlight and they might, you know, mosey out of there. But that really doesn't bother a bear that bad. But noises bother a lot of animals because what happens is when there's a lot of noise facing those animals that um, they can't hear if something else is sneaking up on them. They can't hear if there's a hunter nearby or some other predator and things like that. So they avoid areas that are noisy. And that's what I'm gambling on. But... We'll talk about the electric fence now that we have that. And for those of you that want to know what I'm using for the noisemakers, I'll put a link to that down, of course, in the video description also, so you can check them out. But uh, so the study was done and they determined that a 0.25 joule um, solar powered charging system was good enough. The university study was done by Michigan State University. It was in 2010, and I'm going to put a link to that study so you can read the whole thing if you want to really nerd out on it. And uh, they use those plastic step-in stakes. And here's the other thing when we're talking about setting up an electric fence. I see this over and over and over, so I'm going to talk about it now. Uh, I don't like permanent electric fences. Because we need to weed whack, we need to mow, we need to do a lot of things. And in the wintertime, when the bears are hibernating, who cares? We can take them down and store them. I like solar-powered energizers because those run all the time, and now we don't have to run electricity out to wherever your bee yard is. The other thing is most people put the energizers inside the fenced-in area because bears are smart, and they've learned that when they hear that ticking sound, whenever there's an energizer going, it pulses through the line. So there's a tick. It's not a constant charge on the line. So you hear tick, tick, tick. Bears have excellent hearing. So they've learned to go up to that and swat at it until they stop hearing that ticking sound. So those are kept inside the fence. My other thing is these things are built to handle, in the case of the one that was done in the study here, it'll handle a quarter mile. So a quarter mile of wire. So if you use multiple levels of wires and of course it adds to the mileage of the range of that charging system <clears throat> but 
Uh, so I overdid it for mine. But uh, it turned out it didn't take a lot. And then they have tape going through. I don't like to put the fence right up next to the beehives. If it'll handle a quarter mile, why not go 20 feet or 30 feet even beyond your actual hives? Then when you're in there working on your hives, around them, behind them, next to them, wherever you need to be, you're nowhere near the electric fence, but you're going to turn it off before you go in yourself. But my other th thought line there is... When the bears come up, they're sniffing everything. This is also why I'm against putting educators, people call it, on your electric fence. People hang bacon and things like that on their electric fence to educate the bear when they come in. But see, now you're attracting a bear from way off because you've put the smell of meat in the air, so I'm not a fan of that. But uh, I'd like to keep the bears away from the actual hives. In other words, I don't want a bear within a couple of feet of the hives. They can sniff the honey and everything else and know that there's a resource there because then their activity level, their energy level ramps up the closer they are to the food. So the farther they are back and now they're engaging with an electric fence, it's going to give them an unpleasant shock through the nose, hopefully. Uh, we want to have that happen well away. So they had 100% success was something called the Ken Cove Farm and Fence Solar Power Generator. And that thing sells for $191.75. So you can Google that. It's a Ken Cove 12 volt solar energizer and it only puts out 0.25 joules. So what I've done here is filtered through all the other tests that they did. And I'm giving you the one that was the most successful. It was 100% successful. But I want to just hold this up for you and hopefully you can read that. But what was key, they tried different heights of the charge lines on these plastic fence posts that have a metal piece that goes in the ground and they're plastic step-on posts they're called. But so 0.23 meters for the first one, which is 0.75 feet. Second band, and this is that white plastic polymer band that people use for horses and other livestock and things like that. 0.39 meters or 1.27 feet. And then the third one, 0.28 meters or 1.90 feet. So three bands and then 100% success keeping bears out. And when they did their testing, and of course I'll put the link if you want to read it, but they used all kinds of baits to bring in the bears. And of course, uh, tested it so they had interaction with the electricity, bears response around the electricity, number of events, whether they were unique bears that showed up or the same bears coming back over and over, which often happens with black bears. They're getting educated. They're still hungry. They're looking to get something on their dinner menu here that to add to the buffet that they patrol every night. So you may see the same bears coming back, but they always try something new. They come from another angle. They come from another side of it. They circle it and they smell everything and they listen and they get close and they smell it just like cattle can smell energy on a line so they don't touch it. But uh, so the plastic step and fence post that's the Kenco farm and fence thing that they use. What else do they use here? It's portable fencing it's considered so you can take this down store in the winter time. The uh, 1.3 centimeter white poly tape that has the little wires going through it, those carry the charge. And of course the, the support poles are plastic so they're non-conductive. And then of course there's a grounding rod that comes with it and you need to use everything that they describe there. Even though there are other recommendations for people that where you can charge a line without grounding it, I recommend following the instructions of the charger that you get. And in this case, following the 2010 study by Michigan State University, if you want 100% success, because you can't blame people if something doesn't work, if you ignore all the elements used in the testing that they reported and published. But what I use personally, I overdid it, because I use the Permac Magnum Solar Pack 12 volt system. It has a 30 mile range. It has two heavy duty batteries in it, solar charged, so it can be put anywhere, and that thing is $299. I checked that before I got here. You know, Tractor Supply, all these places carry it, so you can Google these and find them. But mine, it turns out, is way overkill. And uh, I put mine up because a bear came and got into my stuff, and I didn't want to play games, so I got the strongest one I could find. I have not had a bear get into that since. 
So hopefully that answers that question and gives you some food for thought. Try to keep your electric fence well away from your actual hives. There's no reason to run them right up next to it. You can protect a whole area. Why not protect your garden while you're at it? Stuff like that. But with that configuration, it looks like rabbits and uh, skunks and things like that are going to walk under it or be able to. Question number three, Tammy Hoffman. The question is on extracting honey. My lesson learned that using the roller or fork causes lots of small wax pieces. Ooh, the roller. I think we're talking about this thing right here. This is a roller that perforates the wax cappings, which, by the way, I don't like. I've tested everything that I could get my hands on when it comes to uncapping stuff. So when the roller or the fork causes holes of small wax pieces and lots of small wax pieces that end up clogging the filter screens. That's in your uncapping tank, by the way. A lot of people make really good uncapping tanks. We got that coming up this spring. And uh, during a bee class I'm retaking with my son, I recommended using a hot knife because the clogging problem and so on. And then the instructor said that the knife being hot changed the quality of the honey. Okay. Well, here's what I want to talk about because that's a very good question. Change the quality of the honey. We know that overheating honey is bad. Burning honey is bad. Burning beeswax is bad. But I'm going to give you some food for thought on this. Not all hot knives, by the way, are created equal. So the thumbnail for today's video shows a hot knife. And uh, by the way, I've got the, the heated plane. I've got all of this equipment for uncapping. I know that some people like to take uh, a hair dryer, for example, or, um, you know, a hot blower, hot gun, heat guns, and they will melt away the capping of the wax that way. Then you get a bunch of pushback. Oh, you just overheated your honey. You ruined it. You can't call it raw anymore. And people get very zealous about preserving the integrity of the honey during uncapping processes. So heat plays, right? So we have a lot of uh, unheated equipment. You can use the forks as described here, and you can cut down on the number of cappings, but we collect those cappings. Cap wax is really good to have, so not necessarily to avoid that, but these heated knives are really good. And I'm going to, I guess, kind of leave it up to you if uh, you think this is something that you don't want to uh, interact with your wax cappings. But this particular one is the best I can find. And how would you describe an uncapping knife that is plugged into the wall, in this case 120 volt? This is made by uh, Pierce Beekeeping Equipment. Did you know that Pierce Beekeeping Equipment, Pierce, back in 1941 was the first one to produce a heated electric uncapping knife and they got a patent on it. So because it's patented, that should tell you something about these other plug-in heated knives that have come out and may be in violation of the original patent. No great surprise there. But this has nice sharp edges and it has this little bump up here. That's a thermostat. So this unit comes up to temperature and then it turns itself off. So this is self-calibrated. You can get another version that has a dial. So if you really want to cool things down, you get the one with the dial. This doesn't have that. This has a... Normally you have a cord that's six feet because building code is that there has to be a wall outlet within 12 feet of each other so that at any point along that wall, a six foot cord would plug in. Interesting stuff. This is eight feet for the cord. So you've got a lot of room to play here, three prong plug, so it's grounded. But the good news is, of course, I looked into stuff before I answered this question. It has sharp edges and uh, there are ways to use it. Now the, the bottom line question is, is it gonna ruin your raw honey so you can't call it raw honey? If you're really intense about that and you wanna defend it to the core and you wanna make sure that no part of your honey has exceeded any temperatures that could modify or harm it or change its properties, then you're going to go with a cold serrated knife. But other people, including me, back when I was using that serrated knife, you sat there with a hot bucket and you might have even had a, a fryer there so you could keep the heat on it so the water would stay hot while you're doing your uncapping. Then you have multiple knives and they're sitting in there. So we know that water boils at what temperature? 
Water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. In Celsius, 100 degrees. That's why Celsius is so easy. Celsius, zero is frozen, 100 is boiling. So we need 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Did you know if you're setting your tools to keep them hot in between uncapping cycles, that you're actually at a temperature higher than the temperature of one of these hot knives by Pierco. No, I'm sorry, not Pierco, Pierce. I'm confusing them. Okay, so the Pierce company, anyway, guess what this sets at? Between 140 degrees and 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. So that, remember, <clears throat> there it's kind of like radiation. So it's the, uh, the amount of radiation and then the time of exposure. So we limit the exposure or re reduce radiation. So you reduce heat and or elimin eliminate or reduce the amount of time you're exposed to that heat where it could alter the honey that it's in contact with. So anyway, if we're within 140 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're going to come down across the top of your frame. <clears throat> so I'm going to use this plastic frame as an example here. So you're going to uncap and you're going to, well, some people start by coming up first to cut that notch up here. And then you're going to come down and you're going to go like this. And you're going to see a ribbon of that fall off as you cut down. And by the way, did you know there have been efficiency tests done on exactly how to hold this knife when you go down the face of a frame to uncap it? There have been. The angle is 45 degrees. So that's roughly right there. That is the most efficient angle to make use of the weight of the knife and the slicing aspect of that. And then you'll save up to 10 seconds per deep frame as compared to going straight down like this, which some people just like to do straight across. But if you put it at a 45 degree angle and come down, You'll improve the slice and the speed. And so if there's 10 seconds per frame, 10 frames in a box, you save yourself 100 seconds per box. Backyard beekeeper, is that going to be important to you? We're not doing an efficiency review here. We don't care about that. But just to show that that would work, this comes down to how specific you want to be about what the interaction is with the heat of one of these knives, this heating element. This is 300 series stainless steel on the outside of it. It does not overheat. And because it is hot, you can clean it off really easy with 100% cotton rag. Much like this rag I happen to have here, which is a, these are bartender rags, by the way. So they're thin, so it's a cloth, 100% cotton. And while this is hot, you wipe away the wax and everything, it'll be clean as a whistle. And then when this gets really dirty and full of beeswax, you cut it up into pieces and use it as fire starters in your fireplace. How easy is that? So me personally, would I use this? Yeah, of course I would. I have it. I would use it. I'm going to use it. Is it detectable? In other words, honey that's uncapped with one of these knives and honey that's uncapped with a cold knife and then you test the honey that you draw out of that. Can you tell that one of them was cut with a hot knife and the other with a cold knife? No, you can't. Now, if there's smoke and stuff coming off of it, and you have black sweat and everything, and it's borderline, like, you know what the smoke looks like when something is too hot and it comes in contact with beeswax. You know it's detrimental. So this is where it comes into, you're going to get what you pay for, because these things are not cheap. But guess when it's going to wear out? How about never in my lifetime? They have a really good warranty too, by the way. But uh, you buy a cheap one that doesn't have the heat regulated on it, you're on your own. But when you see a lot of smoke coming off and, and it sizzles when it comes down there, you've done it. You've cooked it. You do not want to cook your cappings or your uh, honey that's in those cells when you're getting things open. Because another thing you encounter, which is kind of tough, is you can have crystallized or set honey in the frame. And the hot knives like that go through that really well. And of course, that's not going to come out in your extractor. So that's what you're going to be feeding back to the bees later. But it doesn't cap those easier. So that does become, you know, a challenge when you're using the forks. And I do have a favorite uncapping fork. So I'm going to link a video to that down at the bottom 
if you want to go 100% cold and you don't want to play games with even testing the heat, not to mention the expense of buying one of those pieces of equipment, uh, I'll put that down there too. But I think you can't tell the difference between whether or not you've used that hot knife, you know, just as it cuts, keep it right going. You don't park it on there. You don't lay it on there. Just like an iron, you set it on your shirt and you leave it there. It scorches the shirt. You move it across the shirt and the steam comes off because there's a lot of moisture in honey. So it's kind of protecting itself from being burned there. But if you park it there and it starts to cook, you blow it. Plus there's a plastic frames. I've never even begun to melt a plastic frame with a hot knife. So that should answer that question. And as I said before, there's a demo about the uncapping fork for the purists that don't want any electricity. Plus it's cheap to use an uncapping fork. But uh, uncapping forks do end up giving you lots of little bits and pieces. But that doesn't bother me, you know, getting into the filter because that's the core of the question is I want something that doesn't plug up my filter going into my uncapping tank. So the knives are the best for that, I think. So number four, Emil Andrusco. Question about feeding in spring. Like you, I have used the Hive Alive fondant and it is still on my hives, Southeast PA. So what is the benefit of this fondant versus one-to-one -one sugar water or even pollen patties in early spring? And can the fondant be used for nourishment in splits? So the fondant, I can't believe I don't have one of those around anymore. So one of the fondants, Hive Alive fondant, and we all talked about it this year, and we put it, I put it on more than half of my hives, and I can say that, uh, of course, this is not a big test group, right? Because I only had 20 hives going in. I have right now 17 colonies out of 20 that made it. And uh, of those that made it, that are looking strong, uh, the Hive Alive fondant hives that were fed that way, appear stronger than the others. It's not very scientific because they don't have a lot of data. But uh, they ran, they seem to run cleaner. And what do I mean by that? There's less bee poo on the front of the hives that had hive alive as compared to those that had dry sugar on them. And uh, then of course we had other colonies this year that got nothing, no sugar, no hive alive, and they're still doing fine too. I lost one of those. So, and those are just uh, double five frame nucleus hives. So double stacks, so 10 frames, five over five, two out of three, came through winter perfect, totally ignored. So did the Hive Alive help? I think it did. It took the place of sugar and just based on the cleanliness of the landing board and what's on the face of the hives, it appears it was better for the mid gut, which is the target of that fondant to begin with because it has seaweed extracts in it. The formula was also part of Randy Oliver's recent study where he did um, the pollen packs, pollen patties in spring. There's something called global patties and Hive Alive paid global to make those identical formulas for them, but they also added the Hive Alive to those patties. But other than that, they're the same. So they performed really well. But the question is now that you have them, do you keep them? Do you use them to start swarms and new hive uh, packages and things like that? You could, but it's not as good as the sugar syrup. So one-to-one -one sugar syrup is better once the weather's warm and the bees can fly all the time because that's the advantage of the fondant to begin with. It's, it's a liquid, but it's a semi-solid, and so therefore they're not taking on as much moisture. And they're also utilizing moisture inside the hive to metabolize the fondant, so it gives them uh, something to do with that resource while it's in there as well. And come spring, we can give them the syrup because they can handle it. They can fly all the time. <clears throat> so what can you do with your leftover fondant? Here's what I recommend. If it's a pack that's partially used, and the manufacturer says to do this too, cut the plastic off of it, rinse it out into water, and add that to your sugar syrup. And then feed it back to your bees as a syrup now that will then have all the properties of the fondant in it, but now it's in solution. And uh, you will also have the hive alive in there. And so those of you who are using sugar syrup in spring now, or maybe you didn't have fondant on and now you're getting rid of your sugar packs and things like that. The same thing with the rapid rounds that had dry sugar in them. If there's dead bees up there and stuff like that, of course, get that out of there. But then all you have to do is mix that with hot water and uh, you've made sugar syrup again, feed it back to the bees 
and do all of this before the nectar flow comes on because once the nectar flow really kicks in, which for us is right at the end of this month, that's when they're going to really ignore the sugar syrup and it has the potential to spoil. <clears throat> so there's also this Hive Alive, it's called Feed Enhancer, it has seaweed extract in it. The benefit from that was that uh, it helps with nosema. Nosema is uh, the most concentrated in the gut of the bees in spring. So this is a time of year when we see evidence of nosema spores building up. It impacts their ability to process nutrition and everything else. So that's the benefit of that, but you don't need to use that if you're going to recycle your fondant patties by putting those into solution and feeding those to your bees because what's in that is in those. And of course, take them off before you put honey supers on, and that's it. And there'll be colonies that just don't need anything. None of my colonies finished their Hive Alive fondant packs, so that's good news to me. Because that shows that they had enough resources in the hive in, in the form of honey, which is the goal. And then, of course, when they need any kind of emergency uh, supplement feed, they go up and they get into their uh, Hive Alive fondant packs. And they didn't use a lot of it. Uh, they might have used half, like the one that consumed the most. And I'm very happy to see the bees doing extremely well, those that survived. And the ones, by the way, that died out were not a big surprise. They were challenged already. Late season swarm, one of the hives had been very, had brood disease early on, and so I requeened them later and things like that. So they basically had the tide against them the whole time. Uh, so there were no surprises, nothing like, oh, I thought that colony was really going to make it. And here they just died you know, out of the blue. Now they were small to begin with. Hive number seven died. It was the one that was being raided by yellow jackets. It was a small colony of bees. It was collected from the ground. So it was a tiny swarm to begin with. And uh, they just had a very difficult time. So that's it. And I don't feed the the pollen patties because we have so much pollen coming in the time to have pollen patties on you know would have been the beginning of last month if i had a warm day to get in and put them on but uh, didn't have to do that and now the pollen is doing great lots of pollen lots of different colors that's another thing you want to look at when you're looking at the landing boards of your hives all the different colors of pollen coming in which shows the diversity of the resources that they're getting that's great just like with people the more diverse your fresh produce is coming in Notice I said fresh produce, not fast food. Uh, the more diverse that is in your, your vitamin content, your vitamin profile is going to be more complete. So amino acids and all the good stuff, it'll be better. This is the time of year also as they start building up. If you're trying to slow down a colony and keep them from swarming, for example, you can slow down brood production by collecting some of the pollen and putting a pollen trap on the front of your hive. Question number five, moving on. This is from Ron. Uh, beginning my sixth year beekeeping and saw something new today that I haven't seen before in one of my hives. It is configured with two deeps, so that's two deep boxes, and a feeder turned upside down on top for a feeder shim. So the bottom box contains three plus frames of brood in all stages, two frames of honey, 1.5 frames of bee bread, which is pollen that's been processed by the bees, and two completely empty frames. The top box is still full of capped honey with the exception of about two inches on center of five frames. So that's great. Went right into winter and they didn't use it all. But you're going to have to harvest that stuff because they're going to leave it there. Anyway, moving on. Uh, set for about two inches in the center of five frames. Now the puzzling part to me is in the feeder shim on top, the bees have filled it over half full of new drone comb. And it contains drone brood in all stages as well. I didn't think the queen would cross that much capped honey to lay when she has space in the bottom box. Any thoughts? Yes, I have thoughts. So when you put, when you put a feeder on top of your hives, and it says the feeder's inverted, but there's a feeder shim, a box up there that's empty, and you're going to feed your bees. There's a hole going through the center of that uh, inner cover. And there needs to be something on that blocking it all the time. Uh, when you have a feeder shim around it. Because what's bee space? Bee space is 3 eighths of an inch. When we have more than 3 eighths of an inch of space, they're going to build a uh, beeswax comb up there. And if it's smaller than that, then the potential is for them to seal it up with propolis. 
So when you have a feeder shim and you don't have a feeder in it, you need to plug the cover or put something on top of that to block it because there's all the space up in there. So they're going to build comb. And in this case, they built uh, drone comb. So the second part of the question is, but we have all this honey in that top box underneath that feeder shim. Why did the queen go from down here where the brood area is, where she has lots of room to lay eggs? How come she ended up not only above that honey, but up inside that uh, feeder shim that's now just providing a big empty space up there uh, instead of uh, her avoiding the honey bridge, I call it. And that's because it's wintertime. That's because it's cold. This time of year, you can't just have a honey bridge uh, to prevent the queen from going up there. It's a space that was yet unused. The bees have built comb up there, so they've got enough warmth to do that. And the queen is going to go up there and lay eggs because the brood is always higher up when we go into spring. And if there's more space for them to expand, because you have capped honey in that box, she couldn't lay in there because all the cells are capped and full, except for the little bit in the middle there. But she went above that. Why? It's warmer. And there are cells up there and they're drone cells. So she's going to lay eggs because they're getting prepared for spring. So it's our job to make sure they don't have access to these big voids and open spaces and stuff high up in the hive uh, this time of year. Until they build up and she starts laying and commits herself to the brood down below. And there we go. The workers decided that they would build drone comb up there, which is what they commonly do when they have surplus space in odd corners and upper parts of the hive or out of the extremities, like away from the brood. Uh, they tend to build drone comb. So that's what happened. And we need to close it up. Question number six. And this comes from Athena. Are you still using Betty, Better Comb? Are you still happy with it? I watched your excellent video on the product and your use of it for a swarm. But that was two years ago. Couldn't find anything more recent. Reason for asking is I have two packages arriving tomorrow, which is Thursday, April 7th. So, and was planning on using the wired better comb throughout and now for some strange reason I get cold feet. Perhaps all the naysayers got to me. I don't know who the naysayers are. But initially I was going to use foundationless frames with wax and a starter strip, alternating with black wax foundation frames, and then slowly phase out the plastic foundation. This is better comb. So if you see it up close, for all purposes, that looks like drawn honeycomb. And it is made by biochemists, and they replicated the fats that are used by bees to make beeswax. It is not real beeswax. It's synthetic beeswax. But it acts the same, and the bees do take to it. And uh, so I did practical testing, as with a lot of things that are brand new. I put them out in the hives, and I see if the bees will use them. I don't just, uh, you know, shoot from the hip on that stuff. Just like the skunk stories about how they won't get up off the ground and expose their bellies. I have to test it and see what they're going to do. So I put better comb out there, and now it's all wired, of course. And those are for medium honey supers. Uh, but I only do it in frames where in boxes that are going to be saved for the bees. In other words, I don't put it in a box that's going to go through an extracting process, for example. So there's deep uh, better comb. Now, you said, you being Athena, that you wanted, you wanted to run better comb throughout. I don't do that because that stuff's expensive. And uh, I keep it in my Hive Butler totes, by the way, and store it so it's ready to go. Because if I have to pull old comb out, I like to restore it with comb that's ready to go. And the bees will finish it up. In other words, they close up the edges all the way around, top, bottom, and sides inside the frame. So when it comes to, first of all, whenever you use better comb, I always make sure it's marked on top, like this comb's already marked, better comb. But you'll see that uh, when the bees work this in, they seal it up to where you can't even tell that that was better comb and they do it around all edges, including the bottom. And when I've used foundationless frames, in other words, no starter strips or anything, which I also happen to do, so I checkerboard them, foundationless, better comb, foundationless, better comb, and so on. And when they do the foundationless, they get to the bottom of the frame, they tend to not finish it all the way to the bottom. They leave a travel space under there. So it's interesting to me that they don't chew this away, but rather they connect it everywhere 
and I've shown it in other videos. Yes, I use it. Yes, I'm a fan of it. And this is how, just for example, I caught a swarm in September. And uh, a, the storm swarm, if you looked at that video, by the way. And when you put that in the box, um, in order to give them resources to go, you give them drawn comb if you have it. But a lot of new beekeepers don't have drawn comb to give your bees a jump start. So I had another hive that went into a single 10 frame deep box by itself, nothing else. So I put three better comb frames in the center. And then I put heavy waxed acorn frames outside of that and gave them every resource I could because they didn't have a lot of time. Because when you hive a swarm, they don't have eggs laid. They don't have winter bees developed. They don't have the fat bodied bees that can get them through winter. So we're talking about a tight cluster. That's why the small size, 10 gallon tank equivalent. So it's a single deep 10 frame box. It's roughly 10 gallons, which Dr. Tom Seeley says is optimum, but most people don't invest in a late season swarm because it just won't make it. They made it. And they made it because their resources were not spent building and drawing out brand new comb at a time when they can't do that. So they use it for brew. That's the other thing that you'll hear people say. They don't use it for brew. They'll only use it for honey storage. But uh, they use it for everything. And when I did that uh, horizontal hive inspection, the long Langstroth hive, you'll see all the better comb that's in there that the bees use and they use it for brood and everything else. So yeah, I definitely, I endorse it. It's good stuff. Kicks off, uh, if you're starting off with a swarm and you don't want them to spend all their time and resources because it takes roughly, you know, you hear this stuff recycled all the time, but you know, I don't know if it really does take 16 ounces of honey to make one ounce of comb. And that sounds like a lot, but an ounce of comb is quite a bit, actually. So it saves them that. So now those resources can be used to warm the hive. You know, it's an energy resource for the bees. So it saves them some honey. And uh, it works. I do recommend it. And for those of you that are thinking, well, Fred, a lot of good it did for you to answer Athena here today when she asked a question on the 7th. Well, I answered her question right away so she would know my thoughts and wouldn't wait until Friday. And then, of course, you know, have her package of bees or whatever hived up and not configured it yet. So if you've got the better comb, put it in. I wouldn't waste it on all frames. Like I said, I would checkerboard it to get use it as a guide to get them to fill foundationless frames and things like that. Or I put it in a group of two or three in the center and then go out from there. And it works great. I love this stuff. And you get it from Better B, by the way. Better B, better come. If you go there, and you buy some because now they sell it already in the frames ready to go because that was the other part you used to have to wire it frame it yourself and a lot of people didn't want to do that but i noticed because i checked in on them and they do have it right now which is probably going to sell out because it's something people don't want to do and uh, i do it because they sell the kits where you you get the frames you get the you have to use a 12 volt battery source of course to heat up the wires so that the comb sinks in but some people don't want to do that. They'd rather pay more and it's ex exponentially more expensive to buy it already framed, but they have it. So if you're looking for it framed, you want to get it right now because it's probably going to sell out. Tell them Fred sent you so that you can be sure to pay the same as everybody else that goes there. Question number seven. This is from Bryce Bennett, QMP. QMP stands for Queen Mandibular Pheromone. So good morning, Fred, here in central New Hampshire. It stayed above freezing last night and 55 degrees Fahrenheit predicted today. Bees just got into their first real supply of pollen. Red maple, alder, willow, and aspen are possible sources. Those are likely sources. That's what's going on here too. My question is if a colony is very strong early, saying for before ample drones are available and before local queens are available. Can I make a split and hold the queenless colony with QMP until I get a queen? So queen, QMP, queen mandibular pheromone, they sell a synthetic pheromone and I know it works because I've taken it out and I've had bees that are in swarm mode land on it and collect around it as if there was an actual queen in there. So anyway, if that is possible, how long can the colony be fooled? And thanks for your time and thoughts. So Queen Mandibular Pheromone, if you get it, it comes in little packets. Mine is kept in a freezer. I always have it on hand. 
Because if you find that you have a queenless colony and you don't have another colony that you can take eggs and resources from to get them back on track, you need to have a placeholder in there that fools the bees, the workers, the nurse bees into thinking that a queen is still present. And that's what this queen mandibular pheromone, synthetic pheromones, what it does. You put that in there and the bees do get attracted to it. They come up to it. It's kind of sad because they, they treat it just like it's a queen. And all it is is this little plastic noodle that's a pheromone and you put that in the, in the hive. And of course they spread that pheromone around and that fools them into thinking that there is a queen present. Therefore, your worker bees that are in there don't turn into laying workers. So the next part of the question is, how long is that good for? It's good for three weeks, 21 days. That doesn't mean if, you know, if it was 24 days, 25 days, it wouldn't work. But your job is, of course, to get a new queen in there as quick as possible or pull a frame of eggs and things like that. And if you do that, you need to remove the QMP so that they'll produce queen cells around the eggs that you provide them from another brood frame. But uh, it's good for three weeks. So if you're trying to source another queen and you want to wait until later, and I recommend you do, that's because if people are locally producing queens, you want them to be doing that when the environment is producing an abundance of resources, when it's a time of plenty, when all of the pollen is coming in and there's nectar coming in and it's a time of increase and the bees are really booming, that's the time when you want to see them start developing queen cells because those will be the strongest, most vitamin fortified, most nutritiously, most nutritionally cared for larvae. So it's a good time to do that. So holding off with QMP. So order it, get it, have it handy. That's why you keep it in the freezer. And by the way, where does that come from? Oh yeah, I should tell you this too. You have a hard time trying to find it. So it's actually called temp queen. One word. T-E-M-P-Q-U-E-E-N. And that's a queen pheromone, a synthetic pheromone. It's not very expensive either. It might be like five bucks or something. Well worth it. So, yep, you got three weeks. And that will make sure that you don't end up with laying workers and stuff like that. Moving on to question number eight. Dwayne from Wisconsin. So my question is about bottom boards. Most standard Langstroth bottom boards have a 3 8 inch standoff and a 3 quarter inch standoff on the opposite side. Can you explain why and the advantages and disadvantages of using one over the other? So now we're talking about what's known as the reversible bottom board. Yeah, of course I don't have, with all the junk I have around here, I don't have one of those. But the reversible bottom board, it's supposed to be the 3 8 inch side is the winter position for it. And then of course the 3 quarter inch side is the summer position and you put an entrance reducer in there and then you control the entrance. There is some utility to it. I never used to flip mine either way. I think most people just leave it on the 3 quarter inch side because they don't know about the 3 8 inch side and uh, that that's for winter. And so in winter, it reduces uh, the entrance size. Mice can't get in through a 3 8 inch opening. And uh, so for those of you who live in the state that's got the pygmy shrews, I guess I heard that they can get through, but a 3 8 inch opening, uh, mice can't get through unless they chew the opening and make it bigger. So that's your winter opening, which for me would be fine to leave on any time. So then why on earth do they have a 3 quarter inch side opening? That's because some people use entrance feeders or landing board feeders that have to slip in there. So they need that three quarter inch opening. Some people use oxalic acid vaporization as treatment for uh, miticide. So the varroa destructor mites, those pans have to slide in. A lot of those can't fit through a three eighths inch opening. So there's some utility aspect to that there too. And other people have thought that they need to really open things up during high pollen and nectar flows. Uh, so that the bees in these really large hives are not getting uh, clustered up at the entrance. They have lots of room to move in and out. And uh, we've kind of learned that smaller entrances are just fine for that too. So where that got started, I don't know. But I think it really has a utility aspect. Uh, you can fit things in the entrance, entrance feeders, things like that. And uh, other than that, you could leave the 3 8 inch side opening all the time, in my opinion. 
Then if you want to reduce the entrance, then you just put 3 8 inch high little shims on either side and leave the center open. And now you've got an added layer of protection, so bigger things can't get in there. But that's really what that all comes down to. They used to refer to that as winter and summer. So, but uh, most people don't take their hives completely apart and flip them at all to begin with. But there, So there's some utility to it. Question number nine. So this says, uh, who's this from? Carl Kelly. This says, excellent interview with Dr. Leo. And by the way, the interviews have been a lot of fun recently. Talk to Dr. Leo about horizontal hives. Horizontalhive.com. Ooh. That book right there is The Being. Very good book, by the way. Highly recommend it. Basically a photo format with a lot of good information, too. But if you're showing kids about bees and you want them to see things super close, The Being. Good book. So anyway, since you have direct experience with the hive and weather, most similar to my situation, I seek your advice regarding another set of questions. Because uh, now they're building brood. Do I need to use a queen excluder? And if yes, how will I know where to position it? When during the season, will it likely need to be relocated? Okay, so now we're talking specifically about horizontal hives. So for those of you who have questions about horizontal hives, I highly suggest horizontalhive.com, which is Dr. Leo Sherishkin's website. And there are books there and everything that you could be reading. But when it comes to the layout of the horizontal, the long Langstroth hive, in my case, is the one I have the most experience with. Uh, the entrance that you put on that hive dictates where the brood's going to focus itself. And uh, they also don't migrate a lot of brood in winter, although they might a little bit, but they don't seem to move the way they do with the Langstroth hives, which when they really move up through the hive, so by spring, they're all up underneath that inner cover. But uh, with the Long Lang, um, first of all, I can, I can answer that. I don't use a queen excluder. Don't plan to put a queen excluder in there. And the reason is they're really good at organizing their resources. So, and keep in mind, because it's a horizontal hive, a long Langstroth, uh, you're not treating it uh, the way you would a hive that's a Langstroth vertical situation. Because with a vertical hive, you've got honey supers that are there for you to take off and you pull the whole super. But with a long Langstroth, you're not pulling a whole super. So instead you're pulling your hive butler totes out there and you're going to park it right next to your long lang, and you're going to go through and you're going to make sure that you have enough honey to get your bees through winter. And you're going to pull full frames of nothing but honey. And you're going to put that in your hive butler tote so the bees don't follow it in. And then uh, you're going to carry that back for extraction frame by frame. And so I don't, I'm not a huge fan of uh, the queen excluders anyway. So I'm definitely not putting one on a horizontal hive where I can look at each frame as I pull it. And if it's a partial frame that's got a little bit of brood on it and it's got mostly honey, leave it, I'm going to move that closer to the brood and then I'm going to keep that there. And when I get to the next frame and it's nothing but capped honey, that's one that I'll pull. And then I get another partial frame, I'll push that up and I'll start to bunch them all together. And that's called packing down for winter. But uh, especially in the summertime, the brood is predictably... Uh, concentrated near the entrance and the honey starts to get stored and they're drawing new comb and new frames out as you go. So uh, I don't need it. Don't recommend it. Instead use a follower board which uh, is a solid board that makes the bees think this is the size of their hive and as it grows the population grows and they start using the available space and storing their resources then you move that uh, follower board out and then you take the frames around the other side of it and you put them in and you start to expand the colony horizontally. So really easy to do and I don't do that. So I mean I don't do the queen excluder. Now if I was going to use a queen excluder, let's let's go that route because let's give an answer if somebody really really wants to use a queen excluder then you would want to make sure that your brood is roughly the size of a single deep 10 frame box. So you could uh, count out 10 frames. Why don't we go 11 or 12? So the first 10 to 12 frames in your horizontal box with that entrance outside, that's where you put your queen excluder. And then all the frames beyond that are for nothing but honey because they will store honey, nectar, uh, pollen and everything else uh, on those first 11 or 12 frames and that's enough uh, to keep them feeding their brood through the year. So I think that would be good. 
Dr. Leo, horizontalhive.com. Next, question number 10 from Michelle, Detroit, Michigan. This year, after hearing Bill Hesbach at MBA conference and reading his article, I, uh, like you, eliminated the top entrance, but also insulated the top of my hive. Mr. Hesbach recommends insulating top and sides of the hive for convection and condensing along the sides. You do not insulate the sides of the hive. I'm curious if insulating the sides inhibits this condensation of moisture on the sides that is then available for the bees. What's your experience on this matter? My experience is that I make changes to my hives incrementally through the years. And that way I know uh, when the configuration changes occur, um, whether or not I need to do more. So, and that's true of insulation also. And uh, so I used to, you know, so years ago, you know, 2008, 2009, I was using upper venting and upper entrances. And then as winter came, we would close the upper entrance, but we had a tiny upper vent in there, which is a notch in the inner cover. And that was practice. That was a wide practice almost everywhere by everybody. So, but uh, years went on, and of course, uh, you know, I followed suit that a lot of people did, you know, that uh, moist air rises inside the hive, it needs to get out of there, it needs to vent off, and there were all these elaborate quilt boxes and uh, other ways to capture the moisture as that warm air escapes the hive, so then the dew points established away from the cluster, and it all seemed to make sense, but I never did a uh, quilt top or anything like that, I didn't put burlap in there. And uh, what I did instead was, over time, I started to insulate just the inner cover. So I did that with a feeder shim first. So I put this big, thick wooden feeder shim on there, and then I had feed in the middle. So to provide resources right up on top, uh, rough cut lumber, because rough cut lumber encouraged the bees to propolize the interior surface. So that prevents bacteria and things like that as well. Uh, but then, Within a couple of years of after doing these feeder shims, which are all custom made, and then I did videos showing others how to make them because they were made out of really thick stock, really heavy, cost prohibitive. You wouldn't be shipping those around because they are solid wood. Uh, but then insulated inner covers, and uh, you start reading the science on that, and you find out that if you insulate anything, the first thing you should be insulating, because I've seen other hive configurations where the side walls are insulated really well, makes sense but then the top still had a vent through it and had less insulation than the sidewalls so that did not make sense to me at all because now we've got a cooler top even though there's this heat bubble that travels in there but if you're venting it off you're creating a condensation point right and then some people um you know first they'll say things like they're a home inspector and uh, they know about home construction and civil construction. If you don't vent your attic, you've got problems. You're going to have condensation. Well, I was a home inspector too. So uh, that's a flawed way to look at a beehive to say this is like a human house where the soffits are vented and then you've got a ridge vent through the roof. That has nothing to do with the part of your house that you're living in. You don't go upstairs in somebody's house and see holes in the ceiling that vents off the warm air that you're generating from your central heating and air conditioning unit. The reason your soffits are vented is to keep air movement and to keep the inner sheathing of your roof. You've got shingles on the outside, you've got roof felt, you've got roof sheathing, and then on the inside of that, you've got bare wood, right? So the point was, if you had static air in your attic, you have passive heat coming through your ceiling through your insulation, and it needs to leave that space. You're not living up here. This isn't a space we're trying to keep warm, but what happened is it would condense on the inner surface of your roof sheathing and ice would form. And then when there was a warm up, the ice would melt and you start getting black mold where? In your attic. That has nothing to do with what goes on inside a beehive. So to use that as a model to say, that's why we vent our beehives uh, to get that air out so we don't have condensation in our attic on our roof sheathing, uh, totally different things. So what we have is where the bees live and we keep the air from escaping. 
And it was very easy for those who built the models and did the scientific models to show air movement inside the hive. Then where does that dew point happen? So it happens on the side walls because now we have an insulated inner cover, no air venting out. The bees are down here. And sure, the other thing is the bees are not heating the entire space. That's not their goal. I'm sitting in this room. I am not heating the room. I'm heating my body, but there is passive heat. There's passive heat from my respiration. There's passive heat from the fact that I'm just sitting here, even though it's inefficient for my body to try to heat this room, I'm gonna heat my core enough to keep me alive. And honeybees do that collectively, and that's what the cluster is. So the cluster is where they're keeping themselves warm enough to survive winter, and there's passive heat coming from the bees because bees are respirating, they're generating moisture into the air, and there's some heat coming off of that because their insulation is other bees. So when that heat comes off, it rises, it goes to that inner surface. And if it warms that inner surface because there's insulation above them, then condensation doesn't occur there because condensation will now occur where the cooler surfaces are, and that's the interior sidewalls now. So then it was determined that if the, if the condensation, the dew point is achieved on the interior surface of the sidewall, that's where the moisture comes out, and that's where the bees then, because Dr. Seely made these observations, how thirsty the bees are in winter, and you and I, if you want to survive winter, you also need to be hydrated, just as you do in summer, because you can put off hypothermia by being properly hydrated. Bees, the same thing, they all need water, and they need it year-round. So the condensa condensation on the sidewall is now where they can get it. Now, what if you also insulate the sidewalls? right? So your clusters here, sidewalls are insulated. Now the passive heat is retained even better on the sidewalls too, right? So now the bees can actually loosen the cluster a little bit as the ambient temperature inside the hive away from the cluster is increased because now the sidewalls are also insulated. And so now the bees that need to get the water would go down where the dew point happens and then they'll get their water there, and then those water bees will bring that back into the cluster, which fortifies the nurse bees that are taking care of the winter brood, and there's always some brood in winter. And they're going to, of course, feed and care for the queen, which is the center of the hive's reproductive capability. So I did this in increments. So I put the insulated inner cover on, which so last year that was the uh, B Smart Designs, we talked about their hive stands earlier. They came up with an insulated inner cover that has a hard plastic casing on it so the bees can't chew through it as they would chew through polystyrene, for example. So that's on, and it worked exactly as described. So in other words, the whole top box became warm. Now, that meant that no condensation occurs, no dew point is achieved directly over the cluster of bees in winter, and therefore no water drips down on them and the water that they needed occurs on the interior surfaces, now in the top third of the box. And there's only three quarters of an inch of wood there. And now do I need to insulate it further? Now, depending on where I live, the model of how the heat works and how much loss there is and how much the bees have to work uh, is going to change because there's humidity already in the air in whatever environment you're in. There are weather extremes, there's high winds, there's a lot of things going on. So encapsulating them and shielding them from wind is number one. Going down to just a single entrance on the landing board, which is the only place where air can move in and out, right, uh, became the best model. And this ties in with Dr. Thomas Seeley's um, model also, where you want to keep your hives smaller. And we've demonstrated that in so many different ways. The smaller the cavity is, the better the bees do with or without insulation. Because guess what else is not insulated? Those nucleus colonies. For me, it's five over five. And uh, I was recently talking with Michael Palmer up in Vermont, Northwest Vermont. And uh, he does three levels of nucleus colonies in wooden boxes. The heat rises. It's not venting off through the top. At least I don't think it is but uh, they're surviving in a small space. So for me, the proof that that works uh, shows in how robust they are in spring, and that's what they're doing right now. They're very strong. 
So we weren't sweeping out piles of dead bees and uh, just it was a very interesting uh, dynamic this winter. So insulated covers, now will I continue and start to insulate the side walls too? Well, there's another side to that because the insulated hives were foraging much later in the day in winter. So this is a teeter-totter thing. Uh, they didn't need to forage because they used fewer resources in winter time. So therefore, maybe they didn't have to get out where the colonies that have thin side walls and still the numbers are up, their brood is up. So we're going to find out more about that as we do the inspections. But I will bet you that the brood patterns and the brood sizes and brood strength is going to be equal among these colonies because the ones that could get out and forage sooner because they warmed quicker with these side walls of a thinner hive and still had the insulated inner cover, um, they did just as well as the ones that had the insulated lamb's wool insulated side walls. So what do we need to do? Well, if they're both strong, I don't see a need to do any more insulating down the side walls of my hives where I live. And people further south, of course, might not need that. But the real bottom line here, the real change for me as a beekeeper here in northwestern Pennsylvania has been to eliminate top venting. So insulated inner cover, eliminating top venting, improved colony strength in spring. And uh, bees that are just flying at every opportunity they have to fly as soon as there's a warm enough day for them to do it. Cleansing flights happen sooner and everything else. Where in the more insulated hives, they don't have that sense that outside is uh, heated up the way it has as quickly as the others did. So they would look dead actually, and then they would be flying later, including cleansing flights. So I see an advantage right now for me where I live, insulated inner cover, feeder shim, insulated outer cover, no insulated sidewalls, uh, no venting other than the entrance of the hive. Now, will that configuration change as spring hits and as summer comes on and things heat up? No. And you have to keep in mind, I'm not a honey production guy. I'm not a commercial guy. Uh, this is backyard beekeeping. And this is where even Dr. Seeley says uh, this is not for commercial beekeeping. Uh, because for those who absolutely need, you know, 200 pounds of honey from every hive and things like that, this is not going to be the route to that probably. So because they're going to build more, they're going to add brood, they're going to push their colonies, they're going to get these larger colonies, more bees, more honey, more productivity, more pollination, more everything. So, but a backyard beekeeper, we don't have those pressures. All we have is the overall health and well-being of the colony. And that's not to say that we're superior because we do it that way. I'm just saying I don't have the pressure to earn a living from my beehives. So uh, they are doing everything right on cue, just as they would if they lived in the little hollow of a tree or anything else because the activity looks the same. And uh, so there you go. That's what I'm doing. So does it inhibit condensation? If you add extra insulation, it moves it further down to wherever the dew point happens. So there's that. And does this, in, you know, does it matter? It, it doesn't based on the overall health and well-being of the colony. It's unnecessary to insulate the side walls where I live. So airtight box made out of wood, three quarters of an inch has proved to be fine. Single entrance at the bottom has been all they need. So that works. So I would say that if you're south of me or someplace where the climate, I think the coldest it got this year, maybe minus 14. And that was for a day. Like it doesn't stick around that cold. So there again, and I'll say it over and over, if I were farther north, I don't know how Mike Palmer gets his bees for winter. Um, but if I were further north, more hostile weather conditions, you know, minus 20 degrees, minus 30 degrees for an entire week and stuff like that, I would be looking at some additional insulation on those sidewalls. So, but where I am right now, I think I found my sweet spot. In fact, I think I'm running out of configuration changes. I think I've arrived at the hive configuration that works best for the zone where I live. And we're still testing and, and playing with horizontal hives, of course. More to come on that. Moving on, question number 11. This is from Jerry in Bloomsbury, New Jersey. 
I will need to split at least one of my hives this spring. I want to take the queen and make a nuke with her to try to prevent swarming and let the original hive raise a replacement. I would like to keep the original hive strong for the nectar flow. Would it be a bad idea to take frames of brood from the nuke as she fills them and put them into the original hive to keep them strong while they raise a queen? Okay, so these are resource nucleus colonies of bees. So a nucleus hive, for me, that's the five frame nukes. They're all deeps, by the way. And I'm going to be continuing with double decker nukes. So we'll start them with a single five frame nucleus box. I'm expanding that this year. I'm probably going to have seven or eight of them. These become resource hives for the rest of my apiary. And by that I mean... If I put them in a nucleus box and there's five frames and they fill that with brood and nectar and everything else to start filling up, that's when I put the second box on. And what are they doing in that upper five frame deep nucleus box? Because now it's a double decker. They draw a comb, they build resources, they store honey in that space. That becomes a full environment in a very short amount of time. So the space we're talking about is the equivalent of a 10 frame single deep. The difference is the configuration with one directly over the other. And I can say this right now, that configuration benefits the bees better than a single deep box of 10 frames. The double deep five frames over five is superior for the bees. They work faster in it, they reproduce faster, they manage the space better, and with their honey directly over the brood right there, just like that, they build their numbers faster with no feeding, no help, no winter feed, everything else, that is something that worked remarkably well. Now, because it's a resource hive, let's say I have my other colony over here, I'm gonna put a flow super on it, or I wanna make uh, comb honey on top of that hive over there, and they only have four frames of brood. I can go to any of my resource hives, because keep in mind, I have to keep the numbers down or they're gonna swarm. So I go into those, I make sure I'm not taking the queen off, so I shake off the bees and I take all the capped brood that I care to take, leave the open brood if you want, and I go over and I put that in this colony that I want to strengthen. And then I put a comb, a frame of drawn comb in its place, but I push all the remaining frames together first, so the new frames are the outboard frames. So of the five, the center three would be brood and everything. And I had to continue to do that, you go hive by hive, you have to reduce their numbers. So you can use them to fortify other colonies, whether it's your long lang or it can't be your lands because lands has unique frames and they don't match anything. But you can fortify any other colony or apiary that's lagging behind. Lost a queen. Oh my gosh, queen's gone. What am I going to do now? Well, you go to one of your resource nucleus colonies and you have the option. You can take the queen with her frame of brood and in a queenless colony, I found that I could stick that straight in there. Brood everything with the queen, almost no fighting. So because of an overwhelming influx of new pheromone and we've got hatching workers right away and that queen's pheromone is getting spread right away so that introduction is fast and they accept her right away in the absence of a queen. So now on the flip side of that, but see I want that colony to boost fast because that's a main colony, a big hive. So the nucleus colony can do without a queen as long as they have eggs. They'll start to build their own and they'll replace that queen really fast. And that was very effective last year. That's why I'm expanding nucleus resource hides going into this year and henceforth. So yeah, you can create your split, create your nucleus colony. They build really fast and then take their resources away from them in, in terms of bees themselves or if you need comb from up above, because they're comb building colonies too. You can pull comb with, uh, you know, capped honey on it. You can take that away because they're just going to replace it and they do it really well as a small colony. So resource hives. Bonus. You are never without resources for any colony that's in decline. Now, if they have uh, problems that are brood related or disease related, you have to deal with that separate. You can't just take healthy frames and go and plug those in. That was, uh, yeah, so you're constantly making brood breaks too and uh, getting those out of there. So it's kind of interesting, healthy overall. Question number 12, Jeff Hoffman. 
from Mint Hill, North Carolina. Recently checked my hive and found a frame with 100% drone cells on both sides of it. It was a new foundation recently inserted and I removed and froze a couple of questions. If I left the frame in place, would have the queen continued to lay drone eggs in this frame? I did find one capped queen cell that could have been a super seizure cell, but all the other capped brood frames looked good in density and pattern, so I was not sure uh, it could have been a swarm cell. Uh, so anyway, once they have brood uh, that is drone size cells, will the queen continue to lay drones in those cells? There's two things they do with brood uh, comb. Uh, that is designed for the drones, which are the males. So these are the largest cells next to a queen cell, which is a totally different thing. But once they have drone brood, that's what they use it for. Or they store honey in it, or they'll store pollen in it and use it as uh, food storage. But other than that, if there's any eggs being laid in there, it will always be um, drones. So those would be the males. So they don't shift it over to something else. So I would pull those frames out and put them to the outboard side of it because you can end up with two out of 10 frames of nothing but uh, drone comb inside a, a healthy colony. So it says, uh, at a recent bee class I was at, my son was attending one of the instructors had the same issue and he displayed an observation hive for training. Okay, yeah, once they start, once it's drone comb and drone size cells, that's what they use it for or honey storage. And that's it. So now we're in the fluff section here. So the first thing I should probably get to is the shout out that we'll do today. Had a hard time finding something to uh, link to because I'm looking for somebody who's beginning beekeeping, who's maybe to encourage somebody who's young and starting beekeeping and having a channel where they're teaching about it or somebody that's doing some subject matter that's really good, I think. And, uh, their YouTube channel is not getting enough attention. So that's what we're doing today. The subject matter that I looked for today was the history of beekeeping, because I think it's fun to know uh, where beekeeping began, how beekeeping was done with civilization, and bring that all the way up to what we're doing today. So that's what the search was that I did today, the history of beekeeping. And I found a YouTube channel called Be Interested. And that's the channel name, and they only have 16 subs. So I'll put a link down uh, in the video description here today to the specific uh, video that I thought was interesting that is the history of beekeeping. Because they talked about, this is the first time I've heard this too, and I'm sure many of you already knew it, but uh, the Egyptians were migratory beekeepers. And they had clay cylinders that they kept their bees in. And then they would put them on barges on the Nile and they would follow the nectar flow with their bees. Where today we use 18 wheelers and we've got pollinator contracts and everything else. But in Egypt, they were already doing that thousands of years ago with bees and clay tubes and transporting up and down the Nile to follow the nectar flow. So that was very interesting. So I learned something watching this short film. So if you pop in there, tell them we said hello, give them some encouragement. They've tried some interesting experiments and stuff. So that's my shout out for today. It's a 10 minute video. Nothing to lose, you might learn something. The other thing was, uh, there was an interesting part of the history and they show what we've all seen, you know, the, the cave illustrations and everything that show people climbing these long vines up the face of uh, cliffs and getting to the bees and of course using fire and things like that. But there was another detail in this presentation that was interesting to me that they brought with them the beekeepers that would climb these vines that look like rope ladders. And it's kind of a dizzying height because they actually showed photographs of what that would look like. And uh, they didn't bring with them anyone who would benefit from their death. So. <laughs> So that was interesting. In other words, they wouldn't bring somebody that if they died, gets all their stuff. They brought people that were unrelated to them to work the bees and be that high up. So they wouldn't be encouraged maybe to accelerate their demise. Very interesting angle there. Uh, anyway, um, 
People ask about discount codes if they're still good and stuff. Uh, one of the codes from Hive Butler for discounts used to be Fred 10. Now it's Fred 5. So it's 5% off on that. Uh, people that are buying coffee mugs with bees on them and stuff from me, I put up uh, free shipping, Fred Ship, F R E D S H I P. So all that Teespring stuff, that is still going on. So you get free shipping on that. Oh yeah, and it had a cool little tool. Because one of the things a lot of beekeepers, I know, strange but true, a lot of beekeepers are old people. I know, I don't know who those people are. But anyway, see this tiny flashlight? I just got this, and it's called the MicroStream USB Flashlight. And what it is, is a tiny LED flashlight, but it is super bright. And it has a clip on it. So this can hook on the brim of your baseball hat. And so if you're grafting eggs, or if you're looking for eggs, or you're inspecting your hive, by the way, have a veil on the outside of this. Because when you have a little white light, sometimes the bees fly to it, so be ready for that. But what was cool about this is, the other thing is people don't like to have batteries for them. So you pull out the tip like this, there's a USB plug right there, and then a little light on the side. So you can just put this on your USB charger, charge this flashlight, and it has two power settings. So there's low, and that's the low setting. And then that's low, and then there's a higher setting. So anyway, this is something I thought I would share because you can also drop it in water. Clips on your pocket, so it's got the clip on it. That's a cool tool that I found recently. You can look it up, Google it, Mic MicroStream USB pen light. And what else? The new bee book that I already mentioned that we were talking about when I was talking to Dr. Sherashkin. It's the Beeing. Great photos. It's little kids. This has actually been studied in little kids if you're teaching them. Uh, they have stronger memories of larger format books. So if you're sitting down with grandkids or you have just little kids at home or something, they like the big books because it occupies their entire field of view when they're sitting there looking at that book. So you have an opportunity with a book like that that has fantastic quality images. And another cool part of that book is the photographer that took the pictures has mock-ups showing you how he lit and did the pictures, which is pretty darn rare and uh, so also helpful. So if you want to get a big format table talk book, that thing is $50 or something. That is from horizontalhive.com. Uh, and if you buy it on Amazon, it's still Dr. Leo is selling that book. So if you get it on Amazon, it still comes from Dr. Leo's horizontalhive.com. So wherever you buy it, you're still contributing to Dr. Leo. Great book. Liked it. Pictures, text, everything is great. And so... That's it, I think, for today. So I want to thank you for being here and watching me and listening. And I hope that you learned something new today. And if you have questions for your own, there is a form to fill out on my website, which is fredsfindfowl.com or thewaytobebee.org. And you can visit that and click on the Way to Be page. And there's a form for you to fill out. You can send me your question. And maybe I'll be talking about your question next uh, Friday. So thanks for being here. Be ready. Things are really going to be expanding in the bee yards up here in the northeastern United States. So wherever you are, have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for watching. <music>